Alright guys, Murph's here, and today we're going to discuss tactical lever action rifles. We're going to talk about some of their pros and cons, as well as where I think they fit in in the firearms community, where I think they, their best application resides. First off, a little bit of background. There's been a couple attempts to jumpstart the tactical lever action craze, I guess you could say, over the years. The most notable, the one that had the most staying power, was when manufacturers started producing railed handguards to drop onto already existing rifles. That that generated enough interest, enough you know Instagram posts and stuff like that, in order for manufacturers to start offering factory models with a variety of different tactical features. And this has seemed to have continued to capture the imagination of the Second Amendment community. What are the features that we're talking about that make a tactical lever action rifle so? Well, that would be things like adjustable stocks, some type of optics mount, a railed handguard of one type or another, and a threaded muzzle. A couple things to go along with this. This is not the first attempt to put tactical type stocks on a lever action rifle. Mossberg actually attempted this in their 464 in the late aughts, the you know 2008-2009 time frame. And this was supposed to kind of cash in on the zombie craze at the time. That was their zombie fighting rifle. And it was an M4 style or AR-15 telescoping buttstock added to their already existing 3030 lever action rifle. And it looked terrible absolute cursed image type of deal. I saw one in a gun shop. It felt terrible. It looked terrible. It did not catch on. It did not do well in sales. And that was kind of like an early attempt at jumpstarting the tactical rifle, tactical lever action rifle craze. Now, when it comes to optics mounts and stuff like that, lever action rifles have been made with optics mounts for years. There was an ang angled ejection version of the Winchester Model 94, kind of like this one here. Previously viewed on the channel, link in the description. These are a top eject system normally. However, Winchester came up with an angled eject so that you were able to mount a scope to the top of the receiver and it would not in some way impede reliability or anything along those lines while you were using it. Marlin has also historically utilized side eject models in order to be able to have optics mounted to the top rail. I remember a couple years ago when I was in Germany, um, there was a fella who had just bought a Marlin 1895 Chibberton 4570, and he was very excited to put a red dot on it so it could be his pig gun. The feature that I find most interesting that has come about with tactical lever action rifles has been the threaded muzzle. And we see this in hunting rifles all the time now as well. If you don't have a threaded muzzle on a hunting rifle right now, you are behind the curve when it comes to the rest of the industry. and. I think there's a lot of really great attributes that a suppressor brings to a tactical lever action rifle. We'll talk about that more once we get into pros and cons. Based off of that segue, let's go ahead and get into the pros. Specifically, since I was just talking about suppressors, a suppressed lever action rifle really lends itself more so to being suppressed. So any weapon system minus handguns benefits from the application of a suppressor. It does a lot in order to be able to reduce your sound signature and have positive impact on your overall tactical or hunting situation, whatever it is that you might be doing in this case. Suppressors are an expectation in a lot of countries in Europe because Europe has more laws regarding like sound ordinances and stuff like that. They don't necessarily want to be disturbed by loud noises, firearms included. So you can imagine that a bunch of Germans would be very upset if a range opened up nearby them. But if everyone was using suppressors, it would be less of an impact to their you know, Sunday or something. I don't know. In a semi-automatic system, you don't just have the sound of the shot though. You also have the sound of potentially the, your gas port collecting all those gases and you know running the system and all that kind of stuff as well as the cycling of the action. With the lever action rifle, you can cycle the action as fast or slow as you would like with limited impact to reliability. So that allows you to really take a lot of control of your sound signature at that point. So if maximum suppression was your goal, 
a bolt or lever action suppressed rifle would be very advantageous in this case. And I can see this being very applicable in a lot of hunting type situations and perhaps tactical as well, depending on how far the tactical rabbit hole you go down. In addition to that, Manually operated systems are generally regarded as being more reliable than semi-automatic systems. Now, while I will say that any mechanical system has the possibility for entropy, has the possibility for malfunction, I will admit that I've had fewer malfunctions with manually operated systems than I have with semi-automatic systems. So there's that. Something else that you'll commonly find in lever action rifles is that they're chambered in quite potent cartridges. Now that's not to say that there aren't 22 long rifle chambered lever action rifles out there. There absolutely are. And there's actually a product from CMMG, which is a nine millimeter chambered lever action rifle working from box magazines, which is another example of a cursed image. That rifle looks terrible. I don't know how well it actually performs, but it looks like crap. It looks like it would, it looks like it's very poorly put together. Somebody kind of like did an outline of what they thought a rifle was supposed to look like and then they made it. It looks terrible. I, I legitimately flee that image every time it comes up. But aside from that, generally your lever action rifles are chambered in 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, 45 Colt, 444 Marlin, 4570, so on and so forth. These very powerful cartridges, which is not a bad thing, if be it your hunting man or animal, having a potent cartridge has some definitive benefits to it. You definitely wanna make sure they're bringing enough gun to the fight or the hunt, depending on what it is that you're doing. Another advantage of tactical lever action rifles is that they are more state law blind. So a lot of places that have restrictions on the types of rifles that you can own do not have restrictions on lever action rifles. So if you reside in a state where you cannot necessarily have an AR-15 or an AK or anything along those lines, or the ones that you can have are neutered and not very helpful to your purposes, a tactical lever action rifle might just be advantageous to you. And we'll go over that more here after a little bit. All right, so we talked about the potent chamberings, we talked about suppressors. All right, guys, I think that pretty much covers the pros that I can think of off the top of my head. Why don't we go ahead and get into the cons, of which, honestly, there are quite a few. And coming back to the cartridges, though, yes, a lever action rifle can be chambered in a very potent cartridge, you run into a couple of issues with the cartridges that are commonly found in most lever action rifles, being that most lever action rifles utilize a tubular type magazine. There are box fed. Rifles, in addition to the CMMG offering, there's also like the Browning BLR, which feeds from a box magazine and allows you to be able to utilize Spitzer type ammunition. The Savage Model 99 is the same type of deal. However, that's not the majority. And as far as I know, no one's making a BLR or a Savage 99 Well, first off, no one's making a Savage 99, but those are not being produced in a tactical type variant. So you're stuck with tubular type magazines, which also means that you can't necessarily feed in Spitzer type bullets because of the possibility of chain detonation. So you wind up with these very potent cartridges and very heavy grainages that have rounded noses, which means that they don't necessarily, they have diminished distance and they also move a lot slower. Now, being at a lower velocity makes them better for applications with suppressors. However, you also wind up with a more rainbow like trajectory because they are not ballistically efficient in this case. So if you're trying to push out to greater distances, you're gonna have some struggle. Now, Hornady came out with a lever evolution line of ammunition forever ago, which took advantage of polymer tips to try to bring a bit more of a spitzer type shape to a lot of this ammunition. However, it really only resulted in giving a lot of these rounds like 100 yards additional distance. That's 100 yards you didn't have before, it turns a 30-30 into a 200 yard rifle, or from a 200 yard rifle into a 300 yard rifle, but that's still like what we would expect to be able to do with an AR-15. Especially with a 16 inch barrel, we would expect that we'd be able to push an AR-15 out 
much further. And that is because the 556 gets the opportunity to be more ballistically efficient in this case. In addition to that, by going with more potent cartridges, you wind up with a lot more equal and opposite reaction. You wind up with a lot more recoil because we are slaves to physics. So if you're somebody who's a little bit recoil shy, that additional recoil can slow you down on your split times, which if we're talking about tactical type applications, split times are important, as well as it could induce a flinch and stuff like that throwing off your accuracy. We want rounds to go fast and where we want them to go whenever it is that we're talking about tactical type application. Now, also capacity. Just like, like any shotgun, lever action rifles are limited by barrel length for capacity. So I myself, Longtime viewers of the channel will know this, really love lightweight, handy, short carbines. It's unfortunate for me that like every barrel length that I actually want in a rifle falls into the NFA, which is why I'm gonna continue to keep adding SBRs to my collection because I like SBRs, I like how handy, I like how quick to the shoulder they are and all that kind of stuff. If you do that same type of thing with a lever action rifle, it very quickly becomes a very rounds diminished option at that point. You spend a lot more time loading up. We'll talk about reloading here in a minute. Also, if we decide like, well, I want more rounds in my tactical lever action rifle, we then have to lengthen the barrel, which does a lot to slow us down. That means that we have more weight out front ahead of the pivot point of the rifle, which as we transition from target to target, we have to get more energy to get it started and more energy to get it to stop, which is going to impact our split times yet again. It, that's just, that's physics yet again. So I bring it nice and short. I get it in close to my body. It's, it's very easy to be able to drive from target to target, but I have less ammunition to be able to drive from target to target. When it comes to reloads, lever action rifles are not really set up to be efficient in reloading. So with pump action shotguns, like in this Mossberg Model 500, chambered in 12 gauge, I have this super wide open ejection port, which in tactical shotgun circles has now become very common to double and quad load, which is you have the shells already oriented in your hand and you strip them into the magazine tube. In lever action rifles, you have two options. You have either a side gate, like we see here on this Model 94, or in the case of Henry rifles, you have the magazine spring that you remove inside of and contained within its own tube so that you can then load in ammunition through the top of the magazine tube. So we either load in for the top or the bottom of the magazine tube. Those are our options. A couple of things with that. The side gates are very stiff. Now I tried double loading with this rifle just a little bit ago off camera and I was actually really surprised to find that it wasn't that it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. It was not as smooth as it is with a shotgun. Now, some of that has to do with the fact that I'm much more practiced with doing it with a shotgun, but it also has to do with I was using 30-30 ammunition. That's a very narrow point. It was flat-tipped ammunition, but it's a very narrow tip. So it's difficult to kind of be able to cram them efficiently against each other. If I had something a little bit wider, like say 45 Colt or 44 Magnum, where I have a lot of I have a lot of cartridge rim, and then I also have a flat cartridge nose, it might be a little bit easier to feed them in there. At that point, they're replicating more the shape of a 12 gauge, and a 12 gauge having that big, broad, flat front to it nestles up nicely against the big, broad flat base of it so that you can shove those rounds into the chamber. So it's not as inefficient as I initially thought it might be, but it's also not as efficient as it could be or as it is incomparable tubular fed systems. Well, what about the remo removable magazine tube system, Murph? W wouldn't that be really easy? Then you can just drop in a bunch of rounds, you know, base first into your magazine tube. That seems like that'd be really efficient, but Already with these types of rifles, same with shotguns, you're not necessarily gonna be doing emergency reloads. If you're moving from cover to cover and this rifle runs dry for some reason, you're much better benefited transitioning to a secondary than you are trying to top this gun up in the middle of a fight. You're gonna to wanna to get to cover before you try to top this gun back up. Magazine tube type systems where you remove them, that removable magazine spring, are very space intensive endeavors because I have this length of tube that I have to pull out of the tubular magazine system. So my arm's got to get real long. And depending on the cover that I wind up being able to seek, because we are still talking about tactical situations, that could be potentially detrimental to my limbs or something along that line. So either the rifle has to move out of the way or the magazine spring has to come out and out of the way. 
Either way, it is not efficient to have to disassemble your firearm in order to reload it. Because that's basically what you're doing at that point. Now also, I think just like in shotguns, a couple of the emergency style reloads that you can utilize is popping up in the chamber and then dropping in around. And then, you know, sending single shots down range at that point. Fish your round out, run it in and then get back into the fight that way, that's a way that you can do it. But when it comes to reloading the magazine tube from zero, there's not, it's, it's the issue that I have with tactical pump action or tactical shotguns in general. I keep saying pump action because I can see the Mossberg 500, but tactical shotguns in general, they are rounds limited and you spend a lot of time having to reload them whenever you're going through tactical type situations or potentially having to reload, reload them whenever it is that you're going through tactical type situations. Also, we have to talk about ammunition cost. So with the exception of the nine millimeter offering out there, or 22 as well, because we're not talking about 22 in a practical tactical type sense, when we're talking about 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, all those types of things, these cartridges are expensive. When it comes to 38 Special, which I shoot a lot of, I'm seeing roughly $28, 28 to $30 a box. I pick some up on sale for $25 a box, and I was very excited about that. 357 Magnum's looking like $33 to $36 a box. 44 Special's running up to around like $45 a box. 44 Magnum's getting around $50 a box. 45 Colt is $54 a box for cowboy loads, not even potent like hunting loads or something along that line. When you get into 3030 Winchester, you're looking at like Remington Core Locked for like $21 a box. That's $1.5 around. If I were to get the same amount of 3030 as I would in a box, of FMJ 357 Magnum 50 rounds, it would be 5250 for 50 30 30 rounds. That's a lot. And some people like to act like ammunition cost isn't some sort of factor. Ammunition is going to dictate, and the cost of it is going to dictate how much you have on hand, not just to fight, but also to be able to train with in order to be proficient with a weapon system that's going to take a lot of effort to be proficient with. Money's a resource just as much as anything else. Ammunition is a resource just as much as anything else, and it costs money. Now, another thing that's going to impact your splits is going to be the cycling of the action. Same thing in the pump action shotgun. There's going to be disturbance to your sights or potentially disturbance to your sights as you cycle that action going through your course of fire. These are little things that will wind up to come together in order to slow you down. Whereas if you had a semi-auto, all you really have to do is, reco is conduct recoil management. Which, once you get recoil management down, be it by passive or active means, it doesn't really matter. You'll better be able to drive into those targets to get really good splits. Okay. Let's see here. We talked about... Limitations of the ammunition, the cost of the ammunition. We talked about the capacity. We talked about reloading. And we talked about split times when it comes to cycling the action. I think that pretty much covers the cons of the lever action rifle. So why don't we go ahead and start talking about practical application, Murph. Where does this fit? Does this fit in a competition type sense? Nope. Unless I was going to a dedicated tactical lever action competition, I would not take this up against AR-15s or even AKs. And commonly, I cite AKs as being a limiting factor in most of your, you know, tactical rifle competitions because they have a less efficient manual of arms whenever it comes to the reload. However, they have a more efficient manual of arms just running off of a magazine than the vast majority of your tactical lever actions out there on the market. Okay, well, what about as a duty rifle? Absolutely not. For most police applications, a tactical lever action is probably enough capacity. It's probably enough cartridge. It's probably enough range. However, I do not believe in preparing for what is enough. I want a little bit more than enough. I want a reasonable amount more than enough. So that doesn't mean that every cop needs an M134 minigun, but it does mean that a police officer should still have the ability to be able to rapidly reload their weapon system. They should still have the ability to have flatter shooting trajectories and all that kind of stuff. All the advantages that come with modern tactical rifles. Okay, well what about as a, as a hunting option? That's where I think the tactical lever action really shines. And this might be a bit of a surprise. If you're doing some sort of varmint hunting 
or like pig eradication or something along those lines. The potent cartridge then being able to be combined with night vision accessories and you know lasers and all that kind of stuff makes this to where this would be a really good like varmint or predatory game type hunting option depending on where it is that you live. If you live in a state where you can do that type of hunting, especially if it comes down to like, uh, you know, farm protection and stuff like that, varmint nuisance protection and stuff like that, but you're not allowed to hunt with, you know, modern bottleneck cartridges and stuff like that, but your state does allow straight walled cartridges, a lever action rifle that is adaptable to night vision capabilities would be very advantageous in that case. Okay, well, Murph, I live in a state where, you know, like you mentioned before, I can't own tactical rifles. So why is a tactical lever action not something that you would necessarily recommend for me? Well, at that point, I could understand your interest in a tactical lever action rifle. However, I don't think it's the best use of your time or money. I actually would default to the scout rifle concept, which is something that came from Colonel Jeff Cooper. Now, there's very few things that I actually agree with Colonel Jeff Cooper on. However, in this situation, it kind of kind of shows how his concept overall aged and all that kind of stuff. In this application, in a state where you cannot own modern tactical rifles, a bolt action Scout rifle would be very advantageous. So something that runs off of box magazines, bolt action, manually operated weapon system, adaptable to optics, would be really advantageous. So something along the lines of like a Ruger Ranch rifle. Those are chambered in 556, 762 by 39, 450 Bushmaster, 300 Blackout, 6.5 Grendel. Like there's a ton of really great chamberings in those rifles. A lot of them much cheaper than a lot of the ammunition that you'll find in lever action rifles. They also have flatter shooting trajectories. You can still affix suppressors to the Ruger American ranches. They run off of box magazines, AR-15s, Mini-14 mags, whatever it is that it may be, they run off of those Stanag type of magazines. And even if you're in a state that still limits the capacity of a bolt action rifle, 10 rounds or five rounds in a magazine is better than five or 10 rounds in a tubular magazine. So in a detachable box magazine, it is still way more efficient to be able to drop that magazine, pop in a new one and get right back into what it is that you're doing as opposed to trying to top up a tubular fed design. You still get advantages. The only question remains here, Murph, is am I able to get lights and stuff like that on those types of rifles in order to meet what you consider to be the requirements for a fighting type rifle? And you can, I specifically looked into it on the Ruger American Ranch rifles, but they're, they're, you know, Mossberg MVPs, wherever it is that you wind up at, there are a lot of things that you could do in this category, but for sure, Magpul makes a stock for the Ruger American Ranch rifles that have M-Lock slots on there that you could mount a light to. So in my opinion, if you live in one of those band states, I think you're better served with a scout rifle with either you know, you could do a long eye relief, like two to seven type optic or a one to six on top of the receiver, a red dot, doesn't really matter. I don't care what type of optical setup you go with, as long as you're meeting, in my opinion, the most important thing being all the requirements that you're supposed to have out of a tactical self-defense rifle and all that kind of stuff. All right, Murph, so is what you're saying that the lever action tactical rifle has absolutely no application? No. One of the things that I think often gets forgot about by, you know, Instagram influencers and YouTube content creators in the Second Amendment space and all that kind of stuff is that guns are allowed to just be fun. Not everything has to have some sort of practical application where you, you know, you got to prepare for your worst day and you got to get ready for, you know, Russians fall out of the sky and, and the jackboots are coming down the street right now. What are you going to grab and all that kind of stuff? Guns can just be fun. You can just go out and plink and, and have a rifle or a handgun or whatever that just makes you giggle. There's just something about it that just gives you that pride of ownership of like, that's really cool. That tickles my funny bone. That's the thing that makes me really happy. And if that happens to be in this case, having a tactical lever action that becomes like your cowboy space gun. Excellent, man. That's super awesome. I'm very excited for you. They can't take this guy from you. All right. You know, you go ahead and you hop on Serenity in your brain, you know, in, in your mind, in your mind's eye, your little fantasy world and all that kind of stuff. You hop on Serenity and you go explore the galaxy and, and you know, avoid Reavers and stuff like that. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm very happy for you. The important thing to remember is to not 
push these guns in like when you have a gun that just brings you that that giggle factor and all that kind of stuff don't push it into a category where it doesn't belong so don't sit there and look at a tactical lever action and go that thing's so practical because it is tact because it's got all this tactical stuff on there it's just as good as these other options that's not the case don't get that twisted So when I see people putting together like lever action carving classes, I'm really hoping that those are in states where you can't get semi-automatic rifles in a tactical type setup. Not, you know, so hopefully that those are happening in like New York and like California and stuff like that. Not like Texas or Tennessee where you can absolutely get modern tactical rifles with all the modern tactical features and accoutrement that you could possibly want. All right, guys, I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you guys found this interesting, and it's pretty much what I got. Have a good day.